yeah, for me, I'm just constantly learning about myself, who I am and how I can be a better leader, a better founder, a better person. Welcome back to another episode of the Founder Podcast. My name is Luke Ferris, and I'm the contributing editor here at Founder. Friends, we have a very special episode for you today because we're celebrating the 10 year anniversary of Founder and the Founder Magazine. To do that, we're gonna flip this script a bit, and I'm going to interview Founder CEO, Nathan Chan. We're gonna discuss the challenges he's faced over the past decade, how he's learned, how he's grown as a person, and as a leader and entrepreneur, but most importantly, we're gonna discuss how you've been involved in growing this global community of entrepreneurial education. All right, on to my conversation with Nathan Chan as we discuss the 10 year anniversary of Founder. Nathan, what's up, man? How you doing? Good, thanks. How are you? Are you uh, good? Are you ready for the flipping of the roles? You're on the hot seat today. Yeah, it should be fun. It's uh, it's kind of a weird feeling. I haven't done one of these in a while. Especially, I've never. I don't know if I've ever done one in the studio like this. So yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of uh, sitting back, being an open book, and uh, having a really good conversation and chat. Now, you always started off the interviews asking, "How'd you get your job?" So I'm going to change that up a little bit. Nathan, how did you get your first job ever? Hmm. Oh, this is a good one. So my first job was a paper run. Uh, so I used to deliver pamphlets uh, into letterboxes. Um, and uh, yeah, I remember you could just go into the uh, trading post and you could just inquire. And I used to do it, I think I was probably about 14, 15. So uh, I will never forget. Um, they used to drop the, all the different pamphlets at the front of your place, so like the a- advertisements, and then you'd put them all together. Like you'd make the batches and I'd do them the night before. And then it was hilarious because for whatever reason, uh, my mum used to help me as well. And she used to like, because I couldn't carry all the pamphlets. So they used to, like we used to get them all ready and then she used to put them in the car. And then even she'd help me do them. And then she'd drive like to you know, at one spot and then I'd go and deliver them all and she'd sit there or then, you know, we'd be out all night and I'd make like 10 bucks or $15 or something ridiculous. Like you didn't make much money. Um, So that was my first kind of job where I made money externally. But my first, I reckon, proper official casual job was working at McDonald's. And that was a story. That's a really good story because I remember... Uh, I was getting to, you, in Australia, you can get your first job when you're 14 years old and nine months. I think it's 14 and nine months or around 15. And I didn't get it. I didn't get a casual job straight away. I did the pamphlet run and then I kind of got sick of it because it was too tough. And then my mum was like, you got to get a job. You need to start working, making your own money. So I don't know. I dropped my resume off at a few places. Nothing came of it. And the kind of pressure was on for me to get a job. And so I remember my mum called up uh, McDonald's in Altham and she tried to get me a job and she got me an interview and I went in there and I didn't get the job. And the reason they said I didn't get the job is because my mum called up for me. And then, so I went and I was like, okay, well, that's a lesson in of itself. If you really want something, you've got to go out and try and get and put yourself out there. So then I went to Greensboro McDonald's and I dropped off my resume. And after I dropped off my resume, I called them up like every single week. Hey, any update on my resume? Hey, any update? Do you have any spots? Do you have any spots? Because they said they didn't have any spots. And then I walked in there like three weeks later after calling them three or four times. And they said, yep, we're gonna give you a job purely because you kept hassling us and you're hungry. And that lesson I took with me and have taken with me throughout my whole working career, right? If you want something bad enough, you can get it. And uh, that's how I got my first job. Incredible. Also, moms are very helpful. But again, you don't want to leave that as your strategy to get something like a job or start a business. You want them to be more of a support. That's a great lesson. 
So Nathan, we're we're here right now talking because Founder Magazine is 10 years old, a decade old. Who were you at 10 years old as a kid? What were you like? What were your attributes? Mm. 10 years old as a kid. So what would have been like grade two, I'd say, grade two or grade three. Um, I was a very innocent kid, very... Uh, that's not, you know, in certain situations, I'd be quite shy and I still am, you know. Um, uh, I used to, my, I was always brought up with computers. So my dad, um, I remember he he worked in like, he, he did ha got a second job so he could save up money to be able to buy like one of the early computers. I think it was like a, oh, I can't even remember what they're called, but one of the early computers. And then he got me like a Commodore. So I used to play on that. Um, and then by that stage, maybe when I was in grade two or grade three, yeah, I probably would have played with a Commodore or either got the first PlayStation or even a Wii. Nah, Wii's, Wii's are a bit older. So yeah, I, I used to like gaming and I used to like playing around with computers and technology. Um, I, by that stage, I was quite good at sports. Like I've got decent hand-eye coordination, but, um, I don't like getting bumped. I don't like getting pushed around because I'm not that big. And so I kind of fell into tennis and table tennis. So those were my sports. Um, any contact sports I was, was not very good at. I was good at the skill side of it, like, you know, footy or soccer, but not like the kind of getting bumped or like the kind of physical side of it. So yeah, th those is, that's what I remember from my childhood also. Uh, I was really close with my grandparents who now passed away on my dad's side. So I used to really enjoy spending time with them. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I remember when I was 10, but I don't remember much to be honest. So we've talked about when you were a kid, we talked about when you were a teenager, your first job at McDonald's. Let's fast forward a little bit. Bring me back to the beginning of Founder. What was its primary purpose? Uh, I know horses are somewhat involved, but can you take me back to that initial purpose of Founder and how it's changed over time? Yeah, so um, honestly, uh, when I first uh, kind of started Founder, it was it was by pure accident. It was it was literally by pure accident. So um, I was working in a in an IT job, which I wasn't getting joy from and, and I wasn't really that passionate about it. And uh, yeah, I wanted to I wanted to get a job in marketing. And so I kind of went down this pathway of, you know, studying a master's of marketing and then wanting to kind of exercise my marketing skills. And I thought that I could marry my passions with online marketing. Uh, so I thought I could marry my passions with technology and computers and online with marketing and then I discovered online marketing and then uh, I was looking to launch this magazine because I thought digital magazines were the future this was 10 years ago and uh, I found this platform that allowed you to create your own digital magazine and at first I was going to create a magazine on horse racing with my housemate at the time so my housemate best friend was actually uh now he's on tv every day as a horse racing uh presenter so he's like a he's on tv every day back then he wasn't but he just got a job um at, at racing.com and uh yeah he he we were talking about doing this magazine together for fun just literal passion project and then he was going to be in charge of the content then i was going to be charged of the like the creation of the magazine and the technology side of it and then also the marketing and growing it and that never ended up happening. So um, what happened was I, I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to launch this thing by myself. And it's actually unlike me to do anything by myself. I'm usually doing something with, and I enjoy the company of others. So I usually do something with somebody else. And at first um, I started doing interviews and at, at, start, at the start, and, and it was going to be around entrepreneurship because I was genuinely interested in entrepreneurship. I was hearing entrepreneurship wasn't as big as it is now 10 years ago, but I was starting to hear stories of people in my area because I had no network. I didn't know anybody that was an entrepreneur or a business owner, but I started to hear stories of friends of friends starting online businesses uh, with no experiences whatsoever and building, you know, 
companies that that were doing really really well um and when i say really really well they might be making you know 10 20 30 40 50 grand a month just from building this online company and i was really fascinated by that and i started to listen to podcasts like i found uh, pat flynn who's a who's a kind of an online guy and um i found yarrow who you know and some, some of these people are now my friends which is kind of cool but um i started to listen to these podcasts and i started kind of developing a, a keen interest for what it takes to build a successful online business and so I started to try and interview people. No one would get back to me. So I was going to create this magazine and I called it Key to Success. And it took me ages, 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 ages to get it ready. So, you know, our birthday is March 2013 because we launched on March 5th, 2013. But to create the magazine, I started working on it in 2012 like mid 2012 so it took like eight nine months to just bring the first edition together because i had no idea what i was doing i didn't know anything about publishing i didn't know anything about apps i didn't know anything about editorial or design uh, i didn't even know anything about entrepreneurship which was an absolute joke that and, and i didn't think that it would be a massive company like i all, all i thought was hey I want to create something really cool for fun. And I think so many times when people start businesses, they have these big grandiose dreams that I'm going to create a million dollar business and I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And it's funny when I look back and the purpose of founder, it was really how do we interview successful entrepreneurs to share their stories around how they're building successful businesses and try to demystify how they're doing it. And that purpose the heart and the essence of it within Founder hasn't changed that much. And so, yeah, that's how it started. And I started interviewing people and and I fell in love with it and it was really fun. It's interesting because it almost was like you created a business as a case study for yourself. Like, how could I start something? And I'm gonna do start something by connecting with people who've been there. It's really fascinating. What kept you motivated in those early days? Because it was a side hustle for a while. When, when did that like, that moment switch where you're like, I think this is more than something for fun. Yeah. So um, I think probably, probably when I made the move to get Richard Branson, there, there was a couple of key pivotal points. The first one was the first interview I ever did. I remember uh, it was with a lady named Lynn Hawang and she was uh, the outsourcing angel. And uh, I remember doing that interview. You can still watch it. It's embedded in the first edition of the magazine, that video. Uh, so bad. You Skype, use this recording software called Pamela. That's an Easter egg for all of our founder heads out there that want to go to the first issue and find that. Yeah, I remember being so nervous, so embarrassed. But I remember after doing that interview, uh, I went back home. Uh, I went to see my now ex, Emily. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I was just like... I was so nervous, but I had so much fun. I remember thinking and telling her that I think that's what I'm born to do. Like this is like this, what I'm building with found is what, I, what I'm meant to do. Because it, that feeling, it was like a euphoric feeling after doing it. Um, so that, that was the first step where I was kind of like, yeah, I think I'm onto something. Didn't know whether or what it would be. And then kind of getting the interview with Richard Branson, that was in the first four months, getting that launching it a few months later probably seven months in at that stage that's when i was kind of like you know what i could probably go full time on this thing so it about 15 months after launching founder so uh, mid mid 2014 i went full time on it and it went from side hustle to a full-time thing you talk about that feeling of euphoria where you just almost felt like i have to do this this is it had you experienced that before in your life or was that something that was totally new? No, I'd experienced it before. I think in certain moments, um, it's a hard feeling to describe, but uh, it's really contagious. And uh, yeah, I've experienced it before. Like um, I remember the night before my 21st, I had the Daft Punk concert uh, and uh, they come to Melbourne and they had like, it was the alive tour. So they had the pyramid dome. It was so cool. And like, I didn't drink, 
no alcohol, no drugs or nothing. And I just remember being there and it was just such an incredible feeling being there or like, you know, I've had nights out or like birthdays with all my friends, the closest friends together. And it's just like, this is incredible. So like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty incredible feeling. Um, even before I started Founder, when I traveled around Europe, there was a, a point in time where it was just such an amazing feeling and experience. So yeah, and I've experienced it before, but not, that was the first time ever doing kind of work that I felt it. Do you wish you would have started with co-founders? Looking back? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because I think I could have built Founder way faster. Way, 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 way faster. Um, I've had to learn really a lot about myself and around my weaknesses and my strengths and how to double down on those strengths and kind of just kind of not try and double down on my weaknesses. Um, yeah i think i think yeah you can you can build a company way faster if you have partners and also i think it would have been nice to share the journey with one other person yeah you talk about the the loneliness of being a solo entrepreneur the loneliness of being a founder you talk about it with interview guests all the time you recently took some time off like a, a good chunk of time off to travel and disconnect a little bit from kind of the grind of the business world. How have you managed over the past 10 years to balance your professional life and per personal life? I know it's really important to you and you ask a lot of founders that are on the podcast and that you interview this question, but how have you dealt with that the past 10 years of work-life balance or whatever you want to call it? Mm. So it's really interesting actually. So, um, so ever since I started Founder, basically for a long, long, long time, Luke, if I had spare time, I'd be working on Founder. I reckon I did that for the first seven, eight years. Any spare time I had, I'd be working on Founder. So if I didn't have time allocated in my calendar to hang with my ex, to see my family or to see friends or had an event or something, then I'd be working on Founder. Or I'd be sleeping or eating, I'd be working on Founder. And then, I went through a phase where I felt unstoppable, invincible. There was no stop, only go. And then after COVID in early 2021, I experienced burnout for the first time ever. I remember the last time I was burnt out was probably when I did my year 12 exams. So like what you guys would call your SAT, uh, we, had v we have VCE. And uh, I didn't get a good score. Like academically, I've never achieved. Like I've, I've never done well academically in university, high school, SAT, whatever equivalent. And um, I just remember like waking up in the middle of the night, my heart beating really fast or experiencing this crippling, excruciating anxiety. Um, and like, I wasn't even excited to like do work and stuff. And then I, it took me a while to work out that I was actually burnt out. Like, um, and so ever since then, my, my work-life balance has really, really taken a shaken up to, to be honest with you. And so um, I've definitely, I think work-life balance as a, as a founder or a business owner or an entrepreneur is not, is, is just as much where you allocate your time, but also what you say no to, and also what you're willing to delegate and let go of in the business. So that's been a really, really interesting exercise for me the past couple of years, because now I used to be someone that gets in the detail on every single little thing. And now like that's, you know, I, we could have grown founder way faster if I did that less and just gave more accountability, more trust, more, kind of ownership to others within the company and just say, hey, just go for it and, and just let people go. Um, so now my work-life balance is, is actually, it's literally, if I don't have to, I don't work at night unless I really have to. If I don't have to, I don't work on weekends unless I really have to. And it's very, very rare. I'm very, very big on meditation. I'm meditating every day and most nights. Um, 
yeah, I'm doing a lot to kind of make sure I've got a solid work-life balance. And then I did that trip around South America and I needed it. And I, it just gave me so much time to reflect and think clearly. And I think it's so key, like, you know, you think of racehorses, right? On the topic of racehorses, um, you don't just keep constantly running them. You, you let them take a spell, spend time in the paddock. And I think you're actually doing yourself a disservice as a founder because if you're so scattered and you're so heavily wired because you're working so much and you don't have that balance and you, you need time to think, you need time to reflect. And that ref time to reflect, that's where the gold comes from. That's where you can kind of clear away everything and go, hey, you know what? This is a better path or, hey, this is where, going to go where we're going to go. This is what we need to focus on because you can get so wired up. Um, so yeah, that, that trip was amazing. And yeah, work-life balance for me has been a journey, man. But um, one thing I will tell you is ever since I've started Founder, I've never not gone to a social event that I didn't want to because of work, that I wanted to go to, but I didn't because of work. I've never let that be a defining factor and I've always never canceled on hanging out with my family or just things that I would regret because of work. So I've, but I have worked crazy hours. Like in the first, I'd say, Four years of founder, I operated off next to no sleep. Now, I couldn't do that now. I'm 36. But when I was like 27, 28, like I could do that and I could keep operating. Um, so it was that was what it was, I believe, what was required to get founder to where I wanted it to go by myself. But yeah, I used to have no sleep. It was, it was, it was ridiculous. How did you climb out of that burnout? Because I think burnout affects people differently. And you talked about the physical challenge of like waking up at night, your heart beating. How did you climb out of that cycle? What was what were the steps that you took to say, like, hey, I have a I have a problem. I'm burnt out. What did you do? Quite a few things. Um, started seeing a therapist, which I think is so key. Like people go to the gym to train weights to build their muscles. Going to you know speaking to somebody. Um, is training your mind. Uh, that was the first thing. Second thing, I started doing float tanks. Um, I thought that was really cool. I don't do them anymore, but I thought that was really, I found that really game changing. I started meditating every single day. I got an EA, like a really solid executive assistant who could kind of help me. And it's kind of like another um, kind of pair of arms and legs person on, like on my team, the Nathan team to just help me move things forward and, and kind of help me navigate and work through a whole ton of stuff and prioritize. Um, I, like I said, I, I, I just naturally just kind of started to let go of more at Founder. I found that really refreshing and, and shifting accountability um, versus having it all on me. Um, I just started to slow down, honestly. I just started to slow down and focus more on my health and not make it just so obsessive about work. Um, start training at the gym again, because because it was tough with COVID as well. Uh, COVID was really, really tough. Um, I started going for walks. I started walking. Now these days I get 10,000 steps every single day. Um, started going outside more. And start taking breaks, like in holidays. I think holidays is key. Like because of COVID, I didn't really get a holiday and it was just nonstop. Um, so I found that th those those were the things that I did. And just give it time. It took like two, three months, but just give it time. I think, unfortunately, that's all you can do, right? Uh, and just, yeah, just, just was more kind to myself. Hmm. Yeah, it's a very difficult thing to learn, but through those steps, you can really grow stronger. And do you do you feel like you have changed in the way you're confidently looking at work? Because as as a founder, maybe when you were 27, it was work, 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 and now it maybe looks different. So, where are you getting your confidence from to make decisions to lead founder into the future? Mm. Well, it's it's. It's something I've thought about actually, like, so 
if you want to build anything of true worth and significance, it takes time. Like it takes uh, Mitch, one of my old mentors, he said it takes seven to 10 years to build anything of true worth and significance. And it also has to be an obsession. It just has to, right? So, so there's some of the stuff that I did uh, back in the day, which we talk about now, which we look back on, I think it was required, but it probably wasn't healthy. Um, and now, like, I've been a founder for, like, almost 10 plus years, um, and I've got battle scars. So, you know, uh, there's been some challenges. We've had some ups and downs, and, uh, you know, the decisions that we're making, uh, that I'm making with, uh, you know, a sense of, of confidence and a surety of, of this is the right move, it's come from just experience and just tweaking things and changing things. And, you know, when you when you look at like growing a business, uh, one of my mentors, Stuart Marburg says, it's like you've got like three or four different dials and your job is to kind of tweak those dials. And if you, if you tweak this one dial too much, you have adverse effects or things might crash. But if you, if you just tweak them, just very, you know, just a little bit here, a little bit here, or maybe, and then you dial this one up. Like, it's just about tweaking the dials. So because I've been doing this for a while, I, I definitely don't have all of the answers, but I have, I think, enough to kind of help us move confidently in the next uh, phases for us to build and, and become like a global leader in this space for, for creating and supporting entrepreneurs. Hey Founder Fam, I want to take a quick break from the conversation to talk about a pain point for a lot of you out there, and that's finding quality design help to build your brand. Whether it's a logo, website, or packaging, you can spend hours trying to do it yourself and still end up with nothing. That's where 99designs by Vista comes in. With its contest model, you can have an entire global creative community to participate in your project and submit ideas. It's like having an entire design department at your fingertips. And at Founder, we've worked with 99designs before in the past to create a special issue of our magazine. And it really transformed the quality of the project by having a bunch of concepts to choose from and being able to collaborate with creators from all over the world. From pitch to perfection, 99designs will be there with you every step of the way. They'll help you transform your idea in your head into a valuable piece of content or branding for your business. And together with 99designs, we're offering you a $30 discount on your first design contest. So just head to 99designs.com forward slash founder to learn more or get started on your project today. Okay, now let's jump back into the episode. So the past 10 years, you've led a business, but you've also been the face of the business doing podcasts, interviews for the magazine, being on social, on video. How do you balance being the face of a business, but also having it connected to your personal brand? How do you balance that relationship? Yeah. So um, when I started doing the interviews for Founder and all that kind of stuff, nobody talked about like a building a personal brand, what a personal brand is um, and why it's important. And for a very, very, very long time, up until recently, to be honest, Luke, I didn't really care. Like I, I've never actually strategically wanted to grow my personal brand. I had to do the interviews out of necessity because when I started Founder, I had no money, right? And and it was a business that didn't require that much money to start. So honestly, like um, over time, I've just kind of built it organically, but strategically, I was actually scared. There was a point in time, and it's so bad, like, and I, I've never spoken about this publicly, but I remember like four years ago, like I put out, or three years ago, I put out like an ad that I didn't want to be doing the podcast anymore because I, I became obsessed with this idea of like, I can't have found a revolve around Nathan Chan and all these different things. So I, I'm going to find a host and like, hundreds of people applied and like hundreds of people created videos like applying and, and, you know, auditioning and putting them on YouTube. And in the end, I realized like, hey, I think I just need to double down on me and just keep growing founder. And every, and what I realized was like every iconic brand, you oftentimes, you know, the person behind it, like Richard Branson to Virgin, 
Steve Jobs to Apple, Elon Musk to Tesla. The list kind of goes on and um, it's okay. Like I, I was really kind of fearful that that like it would be, you know, found it would be all about me, but it's not. Like if I, I know that if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, this brand would still grow. And um, yes, you know, we'd have to find somebody else to do the interviews, but we could for sure, man, you could do them. Like it'd be totally fine, right? So um, I think when it comes to building my personal brand, I just want it to be authentic. I want it to be natural. And uh, I want I want people to see my development as I'm going through these journey, this journey of building founder, and I want to, I want to be able to share more of the lessons that I'm learning. Um, so yeah, that's something I want to focus on this year. But it's 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 been a it's been an interesting journey, but it was never by design, my my personal brand or any of that kind of stuff. There's never been a plan. I just naturally did the interviews, and I just naturally have been on camera because that's what the business has needed because that's the kind of business we're in. Right. It connects to the beginning of the ethos where you were Nathan Chan 10 years ago, you were trying to just start a business and you were just curious and wanted to learn. And that's why you did the interviews. So I think it makes sense that that's been a through line and you're ingrained in that, that journey because our audience is connected to you following your journey and who we get on the podcast, who we interview, who we connect with the magazine. I just want to let you know, you've done 500 plus interviews for the magazine, the podcast, that's a lot, man. That is incredible. You always talk about gold. There's this gold you get from interviews, a gold interview, a gold piece of information. What's some of the gold, that gold comes back to you today as teachers from all of those interviews? Oh, it's so tricky, Luke. Like, man, there's so much gold. Like, and that, and that's, that's actually like how I've been actually pretty lucky as well to be able to just speak to these people, but then I take that and I'm just embodying that and then take that into founder and help us grow. But um, so it's like constant free consulting, uh, free mentorship. Um, but man, there's been so much gold over the years. It's, I've done so many interviews, it becomes a huge blur, right? And it's, it's really tough, like to kind of just, to kind of just kind of pinpoint one particular thing or like, some of my favorite insights or my favorite pieces of gold that I've mined. And it only comes in passing, right? Like, wouldn't it be interesting? An interesting case study would be, we took somebody that knew nothing about business or entrepreneurship and we got them to listen to the 500 episodes of the Founder Podcast and start their business or whatever, or, or try to start their business and how far that would take them. Wouldn't, wouldn't that, or, or the person that they would be after it. Better yet, not the outcome, but the person they would be. I think that'd be interesting. But right, wait, have you have you become a different person? Do you think by doing five hundred interviews, like what's changed for you? Yeah, heaps. Um, I think I've become a way better conversationalist. Uh, I've become a way better listener. I've learned how to cultivate presence uh, in a much more deeper way. Um, you'll notice on every single interview that I've ever done, Luke, I'm listening intently um i don't talk over people i let them speak i give them space and i really kind of just ask questions from the gut um and try and put myself in the viewer's shoes um it definitely helped me build my confidence as well uh you know it's so funny uh some of these people you get really 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 nervous because uh, they're so important and they're so successful. But um, over time, it's just like you're something you get used to. And then when you're meeting people in the outs, like, you, like, you know, when on your travels, you feel this more like less nervous. Uh, and I think that's probably yeah, helped build my confidence as well when we're meeting others. If I was to put together a blooper reel of all the interviews, uh, what would be on that blooper reel? What moments were funny or interesting where you, you had, looking back, you laugh, maybe it was a nervous moment, but what would that blooper reel look like for founder interviews? Definitely my first one with Lynn. Uh, that would be a good one. Definitely the one with Grant Cardone. I thought that was really funny and crazy and hilarious. Can you share a little bit about that for folks who haven't seen the video, which is on our YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred percent. So, um, 
Look, I uh, I'd never interviewed Grant before. He's a bit of a controversial character. Uh, we tend to interview founders of well-known company brands. That's kind of the the whole kind of angle. Like people that have built large businesses that impact a lot of people at scale, and you know, you either know the person or you know the brand. And uh, Grant Cardone, very successful in his own right for his personal brand. Um, but never interviewed him because we, it's not so much in the main line of kind of the founders that we interview. And uh, he was coming to Melbourne and uh, a few people were getting in touch with me saying, hey, you got to interview Grant, he's coming down. And I was like, all right, you know what, let's do it. Um, and so I, I interviewed him with uh, an open mind and uh, yeah, he really kind of challenged me. Uh, it was really funny. Um, you know, he was asking me how much money I got in my bank account. I didn't want to share that because I'm just not that kind of person. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was hilarious and it was a good laugh and, it, you know, it, it was funny. And But the interesting thing was there was two sides of our community. One side said, uh, this was like really good. I'm so glad you interviewed him. And the other side was like, Wow, we've lost so I've lost so much respect. I can't believe you'd interview him. This and that, and it was it was interesting, right? Because at the end of the day, there's something you something to learn from everybody. But um, yeah, he's a controversial character. Uh, but yeah, it was funny. It was hilarious. It was a good laugh. And uh, Charlie, who's now our uh, content and brand manager, um, who you work quite closely with, yeah, he reckons that was one of his favorite times, like of at Founder, just because yeah, it was just a great funny experience that we'll always look back on um so that was a good one uh i don't know what else probably interviewing noah kagan that was an interesting one uh because i met noah in the early days so he's the founder of app sumo or app i think it's called sumo now and uh, i met him in the early days and he was a bit kind of standoffish and maybe a bit rude to me and i called him out on it on the podcast and we talked about it and it was kind of like an open, honest conversation, and it was cool. Um, he's a he's a great guy, and uh, we become friends after that. And then, um, yeah, there was a good one as well uh, recently when I was interviewing Trini from Trini London, uh, where she taught me a lesson. Like I've done five hundred interviews, but she, you know I'm still learning. Like one of my common responses is interesting, yeah, interesting, and she was like is it really? And I was like, oh my God, wow. And this was in person. Um, yeah, there's, there's heaps of like, there's, there's heaps of crazy stories. Uh, yeah, interviewing the founder of Dropbox, Drew, co-founder Drew Houston, interviewing Tony Robbins. Probably, you know, the bloopers though are the ones that are probably more often than not done in person. And I think there's something in that. Interesting, Nathan. Uh, let's uh, let's talk about revenue. I'm going to do a little Grant Cardone for you. Uh, every organization needs revenue to stay in business. Uh, but as a startup, as, as a young business, like a lot of our listeners and audience out there, how do you balance profit and revenue to keep your business alive with long-term vision of where you want it to go? Yeah, so that's really tricky and something that I've always wrestled with. Um, also, you gotta ask yourself the question, are you building a cash flow based business or an asset based business? So. Cash flow based businesses, the whole purpose of the business is to generate profit versus an asset based business is the whole purpose of it is to build an entity which is more valuable over time, which then could potentially one day be sold. Can you give me some examples explicitly of those two? Yeah, 100%. So um, somebody that has their own personal brand that is selling perhaps a couple of courses and they're making a few hundred grand a year, that's a cash flow based business where you, you couldn't sell that course business. Like no one's going to go and buy it. They can't buy you. You're the only teacher. Um, versus an asset based business, which is kind of what we're trying to build at Founder, where we're trying to build something of true worth and significance and, and much more scalable and I believe can help a lot more people at a larger scale was like an online education platform where we have many different teachers, many different uh, instructors. Uh, you know, it's not a business that fully revolves around Nathan. Like, you know, the business could still 
prosper without me. Um, and I, I've actually become, I used to be really obsessed with that to the point of founder's detriment. Um, so to answer your original question around like revenue, profit versus long-term vision, um, I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a one or the other and I don't think they're mutually, yeah, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think it just comes down to the goals and where you want to go. And for me, um, this is something that I've wrestled with a lot uh, is like, do I ever want to sell Founder? I started as a passion project. I love what we do. The work that we do is so important. It's so impactful. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's a tricky one. But at the end of the day, like um, I've been on both sides of the table where like if the business isn't making money, then you don't have a business. And so I think first and for and, and like we've never raised money at Founder either. And I, maybe we will one day, but I, I've kind of subscribed to the philosophy these days of like, how do we just build a really sustainable business and the sustainability of the business and the revenue and the profits of the business is actually a reflection of how many people we're helping in the community and how much further we can grow this business. So when you have profits and you, you've got a great sustainable business, it gives you options to have those choices. Um, but you can have a long-term vision and it could be growth at all costs, which I've gone down that path as well. And you keep constantly reinvesting, hardly making any profits. And then it can go the other way sometimes too. So I've, I've been wrestling with all these kind of ways on how do we build founder where do i want it to go and all these different things but really these days like what my sole purpose is is like how do we build a very large company that's a global leader helping create entrepreneurs and supporting entrepreneurs through all of our content our online education platform i'm sure we'll do other things to help and serve entrepreneurs but really be that source um, and, and a leader in that space and really, really, truly help people and and facilitate their growth in some way, shape or form. And the sustainability has to be there for us to do that. Where So that means revenue and profits. It has to, like we have to build a sustainable business, which in turn is, is super profitable and revenue is growing. Um, and if you look at all the iconic companies, uh, they make a lot of revenue and they're super profitable. It's the aligning your purpose as a business with your day-to-day -day business of generating revenue so you can actually continue to grow that purpose and vision to help more people at scale. You talk about entrepreneurs that we connect with, that the whole purpose of Founder's existence. When we talk about them internally at Founder, we, we call them students. And I really like that because whether you're listening to the podcast, you're watching a video, you're doing one of our courses or connecting with our community, you're a student. You're learning on this journey of entrepreneurship. Nathan, you're firsthand in this interview. You're still learning as you go. 10 years in, you're still learning. We're all students of this lifestyle, this community of entrepreneurship. You've connected with these awesome people either in person. I know you've talked to them on the phone. I know you've done video chats from people all over the world that are part of this founder community that are students of the founder brand. What have they taught you about entrepreneurship? Mm, good question. It's really tough, Luke, to dawn upon wisdom of things that I've learned from a wide group. You know what I mean? Um, but what have our students taught taught me? Um, I think that they're like all like all of our students, right? They're just they're they're people with a dream, and they they might be f closer to that dream than others, or they might be just starting that dream, but. I don't know. It's a really tricky question because there's no like door, like I can't do like gauge this kind of wisdom looking down that I can like bestow upon you. That's like, this is what I've learned from all of our students because. How, let me, let me, let me ask you this. How do you feel when you either through email or a video chat, or we've had actually a founder 
folks in the office in, in Melbourne and you've connected with them, you've you talked about talked with them about their business. How do you feel when you're having those conversations with them? Oh, look, I feel really humbled. I feel really humbled that we're, we've been able to create something that is really helping them. Uh, that 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 feeling we talk about gold that's where the real gold is like you can't put a price on that to be able to facilitate someone's growth or to be able to change their life in some way shape or form will have that level of impact is so cool like i'll give you an example so um we got the 10th birthday that's why we're doing this interview and uh we invited, uh, we're going to have a party here in Melbourne and we invited um, a lot of my close uh, business friends and uh, I wanted to open it up to the community here in Melbourne. So I put it out to our students. Um, not if, if you're not a student, you probably, you, you wouldn't have heard about it, but I wanted to specifically put this out to our students, especially our Founder Plus members. And uh, I posted about it in this kind of live chat kind of thing in one of the Facebook groups for one of our programs and courses. And uh, yeah, a lot of people like we, we sold like a, like a, quite a few people in our community are coming now. And one person wrote, "Look, I'd love to come. Uh, a founder has been so life changing, and everything that you guys have done for me, I wouldn't be where I am with my business, and it wouldn't exist if it wasn't for you guys." And I think that's so cool to hear that the work that we're doing in some way, shape or form, that's creating this massive ripple effect. And we can't even, we cannot even get a true gauge on how big or small that is, right? Like there's a lot of people that consume or listen or read or watch our content that we wouldn't even know we've helped them right we only focus on the students and the members of founder plus right so um yeah it's just an incredible feeling right it's it's a really humbling feeling it's a sense of warmth it's a sense of accomplishment it's a sense of achievement and what's even more cool is we're only just getting started right and it's cool to see that ripple effect because we talk about when you take a founder course or you're in our community, we talk about solving problems, how businesses solve problems. And you talked about how it expands. We, we can't really capture it because everyone who's a student of founder, who's a founder plus member, who connects with us, who takes a course, they're helping impact people with their businesses that we don't know. And it just continues to grow and grow. And we're just getting started. You're right, Nathan. So let's just imagine, let's picture in 10 years, in a decade, we're having this same conversation. It's 2033. What does founder look like? 2033. Yeah, that's scary. It's kind of crazy to think that it's been 10 years. It's gone fast in many ways, man. I didn't think didn't think we'd be here. Um so 10 years from now, well, we'd have to have hundreds hundreds of team members, um large-scale platform, true leader, like true leader in the space of of telling stories i think that's really key as well the stories that we tell of the the founders that we either interview or give back and teach on our platform i think we'll be serving founders in more ways than just content i think that's going to be a massive thing for us over time whether it's through coaching which is something that we're starting to really kind of explore coaching and mentorship and how do we link people up with more help versus the done do it yourself. How can we do it with you? Um, even done for you. I, I can see us really helping an entrepreneur in many stages of their journey in many different facets uh, in 10 years time. So it won't just be content. It won't just be courses. It won't just be uh, our, our, our course platform, education platform. I think we can help people in so many more ways. Um, I don't know what those ways are yet, but just continuing to 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 build the brand, tell stories of incredible, successful founders, and even founders that are not like the billionaires. I think that's going to be a big shift as well. How do we shine more of a spotlight on our students and people in our community? And yeah, I, I think we've got a you know a a brand and a presence that is multilingual as well. Uh, not just English. I think that's going to be a massive opportunity for us in the years to come. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that in 10 years time, uh, 
people will look to the founder brand as as something that is an aspirational brand. I'm I'm really passionate about building an iconic brand. How can we build a brand that people aspire to build? Some that some, like founder something like founder. Um, that's uh, yeah. And then also, how do we have hundreds of thousands of successful students? And members who have documented their stories you know we've only got like a thousand like or no a few hundred that we've documented so how do we have thousands or tens of thousands of documented case studies like that would be cool um yeah that 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 would be really cool um so those are some of the things i'd love to see us achieve and accomplish hopefully we'll be talking in 10 years time last question before we get to the hot seat, the hot round, one of your favorite parts of the interview. What have you learned about yourself in the last 10 years of Founders Magazine's history, of the entire business's history? What have you, Nathan Chan, learned about yourself? Mm, so much. Uh, and I, I still learn more about myself every day. Uh, I'm a very impatient person. Um, I'm a very intense person at times. Uh, life you know since i started founder like honestly life is too short to not do things you don't enjoy um i've learned how i never used to like confrontation and i'm getting better with it i've learned how to be better with people how to lead how to to build a business right like um me as an individual i'm I like to reflect on things uh, and I think that's that's a blessing and a curse because sometimes you have to make decisions fast and sometimes I don't like to do that. I know I've just learned so much about myself, Luke. It's been a it's been a journey, right? It's been a big big journey. Like I think personal growth and self-development that goes hand in hand with entrepreneurship. And that's why it's so cool what we do at Founder because you look at the most successful entrepreneurs, they are pretty obsessed with personal development and personal growth and self-improvement, not just in their skills and knowledge as a founder and the, you know, the things that you learn about building a business or growing a business or starting a business, but also how do you develop yourself? So like when I interviewed uh, Scooter Braun, he shared something really interesting. He shared that he recently become really close friends with Jeff Bezos. And he said, he asked Jeff Bezos, like, you know, you've got everything in the world. What, what, what more could you want? And he said, he just wants to evolve. And I think that's all I want to do, right? Like, I just want to keep evolving, living a great life and just having fun. And like, you know, when it comes to work, it's one of, Know, the the most important decisions that you make right who you work with and the work that you do and and for me i feel very lucky and privileged to do the work that i do and the people that i work with and uh yeah for me i'm just constantly learning about myself who i am and how i can be a better leader a better founder a better person um so yeah all right you ready for the hot round here we go let's go no holds bar yep let's go nathan is it harder to start or scale a business? Scale. If you were starting a business tomorrow and you could only choose one thing to start with, a known brand, a problem solving product, or a dynamic co-founder, which would you choose? Only one of the three. Problem solving product. Nathan, when are you the most proud of your business? Uh, when we hear the stories from our students and the impact that founders been able to make on their lives. In one word, I want you to, to describe both the founder team and our audience, our students, which we call the founder fam. How would you describe the founder fam in one word? First one that comes to mind is committed. All right, Nathan, this is your favorite question. If you could have dinner with an entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would it be? But I want you to answer more specifically, where are you eating and what are you eating? Oh, Juicy, uh, gotta be Elon Musk, and I'll take him to my favorite charcoal chicken and chips place because that's one of my favorite foods. I just reckon it'd be so funny and so cool. 
Amazing. I think it will happen one day for sure. Well, thank you so much, Nathan, for being honest, open and sharing about the 10 year anniversary of Founder, your story over the past decade and where we're heading in the future. Hey, Founder fam. I really hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did and learned a bit more about the journey we've been on these past 10 years at Founder. I also wanted to take the time to personally thank you because we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't for your support. Whether you're a podcast listener, social media follower, Founder Plus member, or you've enrolled in one of our online programs, you're part of this global community of founder students that fuel our entrepreneurial education. Now, a founder turning 10, it's as, as much our success as it is yours. So sincerely, thank you. And I look forward to having you alongside us during the next 10 years and beyond. And I'll speak to you soon. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.